Welcome to CBAW Loves, a book club podcast from Community Building Artworks. I'm Seema Ressa. And I'm Amelia Bain. Each episode, Seema and I will invite a rotating cast of fellow writers and artists to discuss a book that we love. We hope you'll read along and join the conversation. Welcome back to CBAW Loves. This month, our virtual book club is reading Who is Wellness For? An Examination of Wellness Culture and Who It Leaves Behind. Deeply researched and beautifully rendered, the book challenged me to examine my own thinking about wellness, including my years-long relationship to yoga and meditation. I also found myself really considering how I show up for people in my life who have experienced traumas that are different than mine and had some really great conversations with people who I want to be able to love better. I love a book that helps me become a better person, and this, I believe, was one such book. So here's our interview with the author of Who is Wellness For, Faria Roshin. So excited to be in conversation with you about this book. I read most of this book in Dhaka. I was Mm. there this January um, and it's like heavily flagged. Mm -hmm. Um, And and it's been just like such an important permission for me to think about so many things that I took for granted about like what I was supposed to feel about things. And Mm. so I'm really, really grateful um, that you put it in the world and that it found its way to me um, Mm. and that we've been able to be in conversation with other writers about it and that we're able to be in conversation with you about it. Um, Yeah. It must have been a pretty hard book to write. Yeah. been brutal it's been really hard yeah yeah it's like it's it's such a journey it's both emotionally and like intellectually rigorous to put those both in one place is an an extraordinary feat how did you take care of yourself while you were doing this work um I think I thought that I was taking care of myself because I was like hitting all the marks. Like I've been doing acupuncture since 2014 religiously every week. I get a massage. I have PT, physical therapy. Like I've been really consistent with how I show up for myself in very like routine ways. And I think I failed myself in retrospect, like mentally and emotionally, because I couldn't have fathomed how hard this would be to excavate this book. I mean, it's an up and down experience. Some days it's good. Some days it's really hard. And like I, for the last six months after experienced a lot of shame, um, just like really didn't want to be publicly seen and like still battle with that. I'm still sort of like, not sure how I feel about being seen Mm -hmm. and what that even means. Um, because there is a cost, there's a huge cost on, on me that I I wasn't anticipating. And it sounds silly, but I think that like vulnerability is very easy to me because I've had to be very vulnerable in my life. So it's not like a skill and like, it's just my being. And then like, I had never prior to this, even though I'd like written about my mom or written about my childhood, I'd ever ever sort of like put the explicitness on a page and that still feels like deeply uncomfortable. So I know that without a doubt, like that I think what I've arrived at is that this is my purpose and I've come here to do and enact my purpose. And I feel, I I was talking to a healer before I put the book out in like January, 2022 and it's this w- woman who in wa- in Wales who speaks to the ascended masters and uh she channels them and uh like the ascendant masters are like buddha and krishna and 
Jesus. They, they're like sort of heavy hitters and um, they guide her. I talked to this woman who channels the Ascendant Masters and they were sort of giving me my like 2020 breakdown, 2022 breakdown, sorry. And they were like, you're going to be really vilified this year and you're going to experience a lot of hatred and you're going to experience a lot of people turning on you. Um, but you're a little bit like Joan of Arc. You, you're here to do what you have to do. So you just have to stand behind it. And I think I, I like carry that message with me a lot. Like I've, I was obsessed with Joan of Arc when I was a child and it makes sense because I just like feel very sort of like I have the sword of God and I'm just running, you know, I'm just sort of running towards liberation and, um, yeah, like liberating not only myself, but my family. Like I'm really trying to do that. As I was reading it, I was, of course, struck by the great gift of your vulnerability. But it wasn't the kind of vulnerability that we're often like asked to commodify and perform, I think, right? Like there is a there is like a a part of literature where they're really looking for us to just be like as fucked up as possible, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> for the for for the entertainment of the people. Mm-hmm. Um, no, there's it's in music, it's in all these places, and that you know. We do that, but there was such an equal claiming of power. Like, yes, Mm -hmm. this happened. And also it is not me. It is Mm -hmm. not this lineage. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious about how those two things interacted as you were writing the book and thinking about the book. I think there's a, a time when you're experiencing trauma where you feel like this is only happening to me. And so it must be my fault. Mm. And then you like go out into the larger world and you're like, well, look, this isn't mm. this much Shocking. more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's wild. It's wild uh, to live through trauma. It's absolutely absurd. Actually that experience of like going b- out into the world and kind of, seeing the advantages that other people have had and you're like, are you serious? <laughs> That's me a lot of the time. I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, this is what I was dealt with, but you can't, you can't resist it at the same time. I think like I've tried so long to just resist my life's purpose because I didn't want to heal. I, I didn't feel like, you know, or like I felt like I was doing enough I was like stubborn about it. I was like, that's it. You know, like I'm doing as much as I possibly can. And the reality is, is like I had to die, which I did many times while I was writing this book. I had to die and be be reborn again and again and again and again and again. And just like continue to just shed old versions of myself that felt as if I couldn't reach for something more. I just had to kind of believe that you know, I have to keep going and and believe that it's possible. Yeah. There's versions of yourself that have to die for you to get into the next, right? Like you you can't. Um, And you miss them, right? Mm. In a way. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad without them. They're holding me back. (laughs) (laughs) So we had a conversation already with a group of writers um, and artists who read the book with us this month. And then we like had this brilliant, wonderful conversation about it. And we asked if they had some questions for you. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. I can't wait to answer. Yeah. It was so super rich. Um, and one of the first ones that came up was, what does love mean to you? Whoa, that's a really good question. The first word that came to my mind was devotion. I don't think that that's accurate necessarily, but what I'm going to just be clear headed and answer it now. What love means to me. I think love recently I was talking to someone about fear and they said the opposite of fear is love. And I think that that's really beautiful because that means that it's like, freedom and full heartedness and, 
an experience of joy and like looking towards the future. It's all of these feelings intermeshed into one. That's what love is. And it's the, it's possibility, it's romance, it's nature. It's love is so much love is God. And I think, yeah, maybe that's it. Like love is God. It's like, it goes back to that word devotion. You, when you love you, you give your all, you, you are fully focused and you are dedicated and that's how I want to love it's beautiful kind of corny no it's great <laughs> sometimes like there's a reason that like like corniness persists right like it has yeah. some, maybe has some truth that it's <laughs> corniness slaps it's true <laughs> I love being corny <laughs> um I would listen to this like really lovely podcast where a conversation between you and Aja Monet. Oh um, yeah. They're so yeah. fantastic. And towards the end of it, you talk about being an ecological writer. Mm. Um, and I have been thinking a lot and I was actually talking to our mutual friend Tharfia about like landscape mm. and landscape in the context of migration, right? Like I think of myself from a floodplain, right? Like from Bangladesh. Mm. But I also really, at least once a week, hike here in Maryland where I live. And I consider this landscape also as part of where I'm from. How do the landscapes that you've lived in, live in, that you experience shape your being? It's so crazy that you are asking me this because my next book is about this. It's like how landscapes and like, like in space and place it's uh, it's called on topophilia. Um, and it's about like, just how like, like environment has affected me. So it's like essays on that. So it's really cool that you're asking me this. It's, it's aligned. And then I'm, I sound like a, an old tune, but I, always talk about this but like my life changed when I started sitting with plant medicines a couple of years ago in particular grandmother ayahuasca and after I I started taking her I felt a deep shift in my the way that I engage with the planet and I think until that point I was being very I completely acclimatized to America and and lost all of my dimensions of being Australian and especially being Bangladeshi and Australian. Like I didn't know what it meant when I came to America and there was no definition of what we meant. So I kind of just became a blur for a really long time. I was just a South Asian person and I just didn't really think about what that meant. Um, And then I started sitting with this medicine and she kind of forced me to start looking at myself more complexly. So I knew who I was. So I had a foundation of self. And so I had to start to sort of see where I assimilated or where I, where I kind of bought into whiteness and where I refused aspects of myself. And that was really powerful. And I think that that became sort of a geographic understanding of land and like how land has such a tectonic shift and, and um, impact on you, you know, as a human being. And so I was fully, fully formed on Australian land, you know, like I, I was fully like, I don't know, like realized as a person culturally um, with that land, because I was so immersed in that nature. I couldn't go out very often, but I could go to the nature and I could sit in the nature and I could sit by the the water and I could um, just be with the land. And I think that those are the moments that I was saved again and again. Every single time I had a connection to nature, I, I felt myself be reborn. And so I owe a lot to that land in particular. But then, of course, it's like Bangladesh and Bangali land. And like that, what does that mean more metaphorically or uh, like on a sort of more like psychosomatic level what does it mean to never really lived on that land but to be from that land and that kind of strangeness that a lot of us exist in um where we feel this sort of like 
longing and desire for a place that we'll never understand and that will never potentially understand us fully because we are an amorphous creation of like so many different things by being like Bangladeshi American or Bangladeshi Australian those two experiences are vastly different um and then like who our families are what all of our individual experiences make it that much more specific you know and I think that that is really cool and 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 that stuff I think has just become a lot more clarified for me by uh by focusing on on all of those elements and allowing those elements to kind of be seen by myself um and acknowledged by myself like I am many um you know also just growing up like being born on Canadian soil or Canadian in Canada like I have many different identities and I don't really feel tied or tethered to one place, but I do feel like a kind of floating existence amongst many different identities. And I think that that really allows me to feel safe in, in the kind of person that I feel like I'm becoming more and more, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think there's a, there's a a section of the book where you're writing about like dreaming, you know, in your childhood of the of this of being in the jungle mm. of, of Bangladesh and right like all of these stories that we were probably both grew up with of a wildness that does not quite exist anymore, right? Has mm. long been plowed away and and yeah. torn asunder. Um, yeah. And you came first to New York, yeah, mm-hmm. which is like really the opposite of wild, mm-hmm. <laughs> but also very wild mm-hmm. in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I moved from New York to LA because I needed land. I needed a connection to nature, and I was very fortunate to edit the book in LA because I felt really immersed here in the soil, and so I felt like I wrote wrote and edited the like final pages and the final chapters with that um, sentiment in mind moving forward just like being very focused on on the land and 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 being feeling immense gratitude for being allowed to be here there's this word epistemicide that is appears a lot of times in this book um and it's such an essential word right um and I think, I don't know if this was the experience of Islam in Australia, but like here, and I, I grew up mostly in this DC metro area, there was a movement in the 90s to really move away from cultural understandings of Islam and into a more like strict Wahhabism, Arabic understanding of Islam, which erased some of our cultural um, ties and some of my older siblings and cousins went to college and came back quite like correcting our parents' pronunciation of Arabic words and and erasing some of our cultural things like turtlenecks under saris and and all of that, right? Um, So there's this impulse towards purity is really what it is, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. this impulse towards some kind of version of purity. And... um, what I really, really loved among many things in this book was how you held Islam as a heritage and like Islamic thinking and technology and growth as a heritage without denying Hinduism, Mm -hmm. also an indigenous heritage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been like quite frowned upon in, you know, there's just a lot of like this purity stuff and I just would love to hear like your thoughts or. Well, it's, you know, it's really interesting because Arabs and Muslims translated a lot of Indian and Vedic texts. So there was a huge relationship with Muslim scholars to Indian thought. They were very revered. India was very revered in Islam and in like Muslim expansion. Um, and even in India, I mean, you know, I can't really speak to I know that there was like 
a lot of discord between Muslims and Hindus, but it's not what we historically now think it is or was. It was actually relatively quite civil and and good. And, um, you know, I think that Islam throughout, in a lot of ways, of course, it was an imperialist colonizer. And yet it had sort of the, the humanity that I think Christian colonizers didn't have. Like, there is a case against Muslim, call, you know, any kind of colonization, obviously, is not good. And I know a lot of indigenous um, cultures were also forced out in Bangladesh included. But I think that there was also like a, a a coexistence definitely between Hinduism and Islam that we don't really talk about or think about anymore because of partition and because of British involvement, which needed and wanted the separation of India. Um, in fact, it benefits from a separated India. So I think that that's sort of where I see our split. I don't think India would be where it's at if it weren't for the British. I don't think the tensions would have ever gone in this high. I think that there would have been negotiations and I think that there would have been, like there was historically, a way through it. And um, as was in India for thousands of years, you know, many different faiths came and went, you know, there's Jainism, there's Sikhism, there's Buddhism, you know, Christianity, like all of that exists in India and all of it coexists, you know, it's like this absurdity of the British to sort of point out, you know, like as it did in so many colonizers use as a tactic and a tool to kind of turn people against one another. It doesn't make sense, for example, why Kolkata is in a different country. It doesn't mm. make any sense. We are the same people. We speak the same language. We're the same culture. Um, and I think it's very disappointing, sort of this nationalistic thing that's become like, you know, very, I think, blatant in South Asian identities. Not that it, it's not important to be Bangladeshi, but what does it mean? You know, like, what does it really mean? Like, what does it mean to stand behind a national identity? I always question that. Yeah. That's like kind of went away from your question. Sorry. No, I loved it, though. I loved it, though. I, mean, I think of this all the time. Like, my family was in Golgotha and moved in partition. And there was always wow. long history of longing you know my father worked mm. really hard to get us art and our my me just me um the youngest of his daughters that he had still control over to get like nri status and you know mm. like he just really felt like he felt so disconnected he felt such an experience of not belonging in bangladesh because yeah you know. um and then i think in in migrating all the way to the West, there's like a, a double down on whatever parts of your identity um, you feel like you can get the most purchase with. Mm -hmm. Purchase isn't the right word, but it's like, where can I, where can I most fit in? Where can I most, totally. right? Like get, like get my feet yeah. in the ground. Um, yeah. And there's a falseness, like to your point, right? It, it, it the border is, is false. Yeah. Um, and I've, I felt like in reading, you know, I'm like a, a, a big time yoga goer and have mostly been to yoga classes led by white women mm. and have mostly been like vaguely disgusted by myself <laughs> or like the way I put on my leggings and go in there, <laughs> like, you know, and I'm just like, what I'm going to do is not be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're fighting back. <laughs> I'm fighting back by not being friendly, but also because I feel like some kind of poser for reading the Mahabharata, right? Because like that, mm. possible, right? Mm. And I and and so there's this like multiple layers of disconnection from like, oh, this is yeah, this thing isn't exactly mine because my family is not Hindu, yeah, and this, yeah, yeah. you know, like like what are the which doesn't make any sense, yeah. No. Because Indian culture is Hindu culture as well. You know, it is it is an extension of that. And like we owe so much to Hinduism. And I think that 
Islam benefits when it remembers that Muslims benefit, but it's it's forced tension. It's it's fake. You know, it's like it's not tension that ever existed. It's just it's sad that it, that's where we're here right now. But I hear you. I think that, you know, like I I do. I've done goddess worship with, you know, the different goddesses. And I, I go to Hindu temples and I have a lot of respect for Hindu culture. I grew up around of Hindu Bengalis um, because of my parents. And so I think that I, you know, I just, I love, I mean, then, I, you know, I love Satyajit Roy and I love Rabindranath Tagore who are both, you know, Bengali Indians, technically what, you know, you would be now. And I think that we owe a lot of our Bengali identity to, to a lot of these people. Um, but it's an it's a it's an amalgamation of so much, you know, and that's what's so important. Like we're varied, and there's many different versions of us. And um, yeah, I mean, I hate borders, so I'm just sort of here for a borderless world. Like that's what I'm trying to envision for us. There, there are all of these practices that are not like quote unquote ours that we can benefit yeah. from, and perhaps. I've been thinking more recently, like, um, how do we take what we need mm -hmm. um, with respect? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that comes across in this text mm -hmm. so much, like the respect and also the recognition, like, no, I deserve what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, I worked really hard on that because I think it means integrity. Like you have to do it consistently. You can't just do it with one thing and not the other. And it's also a learning. It's the it's the constant desire to learn. Like Mia Mingus talks about this a lot. And they write about um, just all of the ways that you can learn how to be a more accountable person. And it's not like choosing victimhood or being like, oh my God, I you know, like feeling shame or like you're not doing enough. It's sort of that constancy to be in communication with yourself and your community and like keeping yourself, trusting yourself and doing the work to trust yourself. So, you know, you have integrity and always working towards that integrity and understanding like, oh, there are moments that you're going to fall off, but you're going to get back on there. And you you know that there's a responsibility to tell the truth, to be better, to um, invest in truth. And I think not enough of us want to invest in goodness because we haven't experienced goodness. Mm. So because we haven't experienced it, we feel like we have every right to not give it to other people, almost as if it's like, more work to be a good person but it's just as more work to be a shitty person and you you don't get anything out of it you know it's like it's just a terrible feeling it, you just perpetuate your own shitty cycle what grandmother ayahuasca gave to me was a desire to be principled and that's what I really carry with me like a desire to to, to work with principle and like yeah just to know that I am also fallible and having compassion for myself, even when I am. Doing the work to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the shit right there, right? Like that. And that's the yeah. shit that, like, really, in systems of abuse, they really are re like, that's the part of you that's ground down. It's like, no, that mm -hmm. didn't really happen, or, you know, mm -hmm. or it wasn't mm -hmm. so bad, or, mm -hmm. you know, like, absolutely don't listen to yourself. Yeah. And that, that practice is one that has to be continually renewed. And I think Amelia had this, this note that she'd underlined about endurance. Yeah, you wrote about like the endurance necessary for, um, you know, all of this, this work that you do and commitment to continuing that work always. Um, mm -hmm. I was just interested in that concept of endurance. It is endurance, isn't it? Because you have to keep going and you have to remind yeah. yourself that it's worth fighting for. One of my favorite writers is John O'Donohue. Actually, he's one of my favorite thinkers. He's a Celtic monk and poet. And I love, I think, people who are in love with God because I think that that keeps you on track. 
because it doesn't mean that you can't fall or you can't be dumb or like, you know, you can't, you know, make mistakes, but it's like having that kind of cord run through you of like having a divine longing to be in the longing of divine presence, I think is a really beautiful thing. Um, and that I think takes, that's, that makes endurance easier because you don't, you can't source endurance from anything else other than like purpose. Like this is my divine purpose to do this, to be a good purpose to, sorry, to go, to be a good person. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, like it's, that should be enough. I think I write that in the book too. Like that should be enough for us to want that, but it's not. And it's, I think it's because nobody has a sales pitch for being a good person. Like you don't see like characters on television, like, you know, that are good people just because they are, unless they're like Ned Flanders and it's weird, you know, it's like, Oh my God. <laughs> like that's weird. the punchline. Yeah. Yeah. That's the punchline. Like you love God and you're like fucking obsessed with being a good person. And like, that's creepy. Why? Cause the default and I think this is American programming and like sort of literally like programming this idea of like the default is just like, yeah, you're a shitty person. You're an average, mediocre, and shitty person. And it's like, that's not taught anywhere else in the world. You know, like the initiative for every other person in every other country, I would say this is like a grand statement, but I think it's true, you know, like that you should fight to be better, that you should be thinking about your neighbor, that you should be thinking about community, you know, like by and large, like, you know, Australia and Canada are both like socialist countries because they, you know, care about healthcare and they care about, you know, uh, their population, like really like, um, something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is like how the New York Times um, interviewed a bunch of us. There was like a piece on Australia and how they survived COVID and just the sort of success rates of like people with COVID. And so they were interviewing a lot of Australians just to be like, what do you think? Why do you think there was a success in Australia? And most of them, I think, were like, there's a trust in the government. And that's why. Because when you trust your government and you know that they're looking out for you, you're going to listen to what they say. You're going to care about what they're saying. You're actually considering your, you know, the people around you. It's not just like you fight for yourself and that's it. It's not just an individualistic sort of society. And I think that having courage really is about that, like continuing to be a good person despite all the odds against you, despite how f***ing terrible people have treated you, despite your own mother not even being able to love you, like having the power and the reserve of like, I don't know, the, the reserves to just keep going. I think like that's been something that's been really beneficial for me, just remembering that like, if that's the only legacy I get to leave, then I get to leave that. Like, I want to be a person who tries hard to be a good person. I think a lot about, I think probably once a week, I think about this idea of John O'Donohue's of the difference between identity and biography. Mm. And how often we maybe feel compelled to think of ourselves by our biography which we maybe have no control over. Mm -hmm. No, we definitely mm -hmm. have very mm -hmm. little control mm -hmm. over, certainly our early biography. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about here feels like identity, like this decision mm -hmm. of I trust that what mm -hmm. I want to be, who I am going to be, how I am going to be in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a lot of pressure for me from my parents to really look at myself as a product of this biography. Right. Like mm. you are a good Muslim girl. You are a good Bangla girl. Without a lot of details of what the good man, yeah. <laughs> you know, like what all those things meant. And the work of perhaps adulthood and perhaps writing and perhaps poetry is like uncovering um what identity means to us, like who I really mm. am. I wasn't I, I was definitely affected by the good Muslim girl narrative, 
but not necessarily by my mom and dad. It was very much by my sister who like started wearing the hijab when I was 13 and she was 20. And she, she, she became very religious for a while and there was a lot of judgment and, you know, she, it was difficult because she, I was queer and I was openly queer and I would tell her that. And she was just very like confused by me and very confused by like my everything, you know, my openness and, and she was very controlling. And I think that that really affected me and really like screwed me over. But my relationship to Islam was very alhamdulillah, like clear and clean my parents didn't really do much damage in that front with me. We went to Umrah when I was 19 and my mom was terrible about it, but like that, that was it. Like I didn't have a lot of experiences where I felt like I was being drilled this idea so I could like claim God as my own. I never had that fear or like it never, and I was never, there was never a conflict that I was queer and that I was Muslim. Like I've never had that feeling in my life. And like, it was you know, like I, you know, things like drinking or or even having sex, like I just kind of adapted and I understood that like my core of the core of my being, and I've always known this because my dad's very Sufi. I have an untenable relationship to God. I don't need to be a version of me that's not real. You know, I think that Islam is a very, very progressive I hate that word, but it's a very expansive and interesting and deep faith that as modern, modern Muslims or Muslims in the modern world, I don't think we fully engage like how philosophical and deeply like cryptic Islam is in a lot of ways too. Like it's very layered. It's very spiritual. It's very esoteric. And when I was researching who is wellness for and I was like learning about astrology and Islam's role in astrology I was just like are you kidding me like it was like an entire lost archive that I found I was just like this is me like it makes so much sense the first person that ever read an astrologer is an astrology reading for me was this woman my sister introduced me to who was a Muslim Turkish Muslim astrologer so like I've always had like a Muslim lineage of like this you know, even this teaching and to find out that it was like very Muslim and that like Muslims have always had a very deep understanding of magic and that there's so much in Islam that we don't understand as magic, but it is, I mean, jinn, like even the the sort of like existence of jinn, like we live and we understand And this kind of ties into my, even my relationship with grandmother ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is not outside of the realm of Islam. You know, it's not outside of the vast potency of God. I think like it is just a representation of God. You know, my relationship to ayahuasca is my relationship to God. It's like the same in everything. And I think that Islam is deeply wise because it understands those kind of parallels and the kind of depth of language that we're kind of dealing with you know uh, Quranic Arabic is beyond comprehension and we don't I think as human beings like really fully understand it and I I think that I kind of look towards you know people like Rumi that wrote about the the yeah there's just sort of like variance and 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 like what's what it means to be spiritually in a relationship with God I think that's far more interesting than being like, well, I was told I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I have to have this, this, I have to be restricted like that. Like Islam is the first word is read. Get the fuck out of here. Like it's telling you to <laughs> get smarter. Like this is the first thing it's telling you, like s- stop, like think beyond these parameters, you know, God is like, if God is all and, you know, you know, then God is literally all. And I think that there's a lot of like interesting art about, you know, Muslims are coming out of those like post 9-11 silence and we're finally at being allowed to kind of speak. And I think a lot of us are like, what does it mean to sort of make art again and make, you know, 
things when you, when your people are not like when all some of you and many of you are still being bombed and obliterated, but and that you know there's a tether thing there and a, and a responsibility, but simultaneously many of us are free, and we get to reimagine and determine the next phase and the future of how we survive on this planet. I love this idea too of like how we what we build next, right? Like this idea mm. that that it's not static, that it isn't one thing. There's this, um, it's it's an Annie Dillard quote from For the Time Being, where she says there was no holier time than this, mm. right? Like this, it's not that the holiness is in the past, but like this also is a holy moment. This also mm. is a moment where we get to have big experiences and, and shape the next thing. Mm-hmm. But of course, it's very scary. It's easier to hide in the thing that was, that we know that was past rather than breaching, like, no, I, I won't take that with me and I will take this with me and I mm-hmm. will, you know, reclaim astrology, for example, in Islam, even if some people, you know, think that that's quite a sin or mm-hmm. some, people, you know, whatever they feel about it, sort of coming back, if I may, to the idea of identity as apart from biography, mm-hmm. I wanted to, Maybe this is a corny question, but corniness slaps. Mm. You heard it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. Is like where where has this experience of either researching this book, and I think you talked about it a little bit with the astrology, or of discovering your identity outside of the sort of confinement of your family of origin? Can you talk about the experience of joy? I guess is my question. Mm. The experience of joy. I mean, my name means joy. And I think about that a lot. Um, You mean as a child or like now, like always? As you've been, I mean, whatever you want to talk about, but I was asking about like in this process of maybe creating a fissure from biography and what you maybe Mm -hmm. had as a child, like you had to be, what has brought you joy in this process and where, what's your commitment to joy like? What's brought me joy has probably been becoming myself and like learning who I am for the first time and not holding back, not restricting, just being open to those parts of me. And I think that I, I I was, I have heard that I was a very joyous child And I've been sort of reflecting over the last few weeks and really since the, there's been all of these like massive eclipses that have been happening. And um, I have been feeling them like a lot of people. And I think what I've been seeing and reflecting on is that I am a sad girl and I've been a sad girl for a really long time. And I think that that's a product of my life. Like, I think that I've had, uh, I've always been really like intense and, um, it's just like, now I understand, like, as, as I get older, I'm like, Oh, like I had a really good life. That makes sense. Um, but I'm like Capricorn, you know, like I'm not, I like, like, (laughs) I know joy is a very hard thing for me to come across, unfortunately. But I do try and, I guess, like really focus on telling the truth. And that weirdly brings me a lot of joy. You know, I like, I like sitting with medicines. I like sitting with grandmother ayahuasca because I think I love the feeling of like looking at myself more and deeply. And I think that that's what I've come here to do. Uh, is also just to do that, to see myself. I think that's really my mission and like to write about it, you know, and see what happens and and to see who it connects with and and knowing that it's, um, that everything that it comes with, even if it's not like standard, like good and happy all the time, it's like, it's my path. And I think that that brings me joy, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't look like other people's joy where I'm like, you know, like, yeah, I've I've been sort of under strain for much of my life. And I think that's caused me some residual kind of like sternness almost. Like I live my life very like, uh, 
Um, but I'm also very, I like, I'm a jokester and I'm very funny and I'm weird. And like, you know, so it's like, I guess that's, that's the balance, but I do, I do think that I'm kind of a sad girl. <laughs> I mean, it's working for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's like, you know, I think part of what I was thinking about as I was preparing for this conversation was how there is humor in the book, despite mm. like, the weight of the like even asking again again like what why do you meditate Mm -hmm. like at a point it's like a joke between us like fuck (laughs) I know you see me like (laughs) yeah yeah I'm 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 a clown you know I love I love uh humor is so important in when you're doing work like this you can't not laugh um so laughing and is is very very important to me and I think yeah, I do that by like being funny and weird and and making fun of myself, I think. I think of like the laughter on the heels of tears as my favorite. Like that's where mm-hmm. I feel like God. <laughs> like it's like, it's there where I feel like I am across time, mm. across versions of myself, but it can't happen without the tears, right? Yeah, yeah, I hear that. That's what brings it to the, to the next edge, yeah. I know one of the questions that lots of folks asked us to ask you was about um, the structure of the book. And um, there's the Robin Wall Kimmer quote that you sort of set up, set the book up with in the intro that Amelia, maybe you want to read it, putting Amelia on the spot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, now I'm ready. (laughs) <laughs> we understand a thing only when we understand it with all four aspects of our being, mind, body, emotion, and spirit. Where in the process of writing did you find that quote or was it on your mind early on? Did it help form the book or did you find it when you needed it later? I think I found it when I needed it. I, I, have, a, I have luck with writing where like it comes like whenever I need it. It like is like a oh like the word or whatever it it just comes to me so I feel very lucky. I don't think I knew like my book proposal was very different to what I ended up writing about, and I had to sort of really meditate on why I wanted to write this book and what it was that I wanted to say, and. I think in that way, I feel really proud of myself because I said everything I needed to say. Like, it was very much like, I need to tell people, I need to ask people why they meditate and I need to talk about yoga and I need to talk about why um, it is deeply, deeply dangerous that we live in a world that has taken so much from indigenous cultures after colonizing them for centuries and decades, and then feel no remorse or no desire to give back or have live in mutual accordance. And that to me is really the disease of the world. Like that's where it is. That's where it starts. That's, that is the focal point of like, when you create people to think that they owe nothing for whatever they have, there's no responsibility. And that's why sacred responsibility or like sacred mutuality, which Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about and which the book kind of finishes on is a thing that really sort of, I think that became the through line for me. Sorry, it's sacred reciprocity. This feeling of just like, that's what's missing. It's not about don't practice yoga. It's, it's, we're far too gone for that. And it doesn't make sense. Like people benefit from it. You know, it's like, it's not like, well, you can't then, like, well, who gets anything from that? Nobody. And it's not about shaming people either, because that's not interesting to me. It's not about pointing fingers and being like, well, you should feel bad. I think that that's sort of like, you know, like, we're far beyond that point. Now it's how do you actually engage where you feel and know that you um are responsible to your neighbor, to yourself, to the context of these lineages, to the people that worked tirelessly and difficultly thousands of years ago, trying to figure out what it means to be human. I mean, I think that it's really disappointing and says so much about the lack of South Asian representation 
today even in the world because Buddhism and Hinduism and, and yoga and meditation have all been removed of, in, of Indians. You can't see any brown people attached to them, except when it's like, you know, like Deepak Chopra and Jay Shetty. That's like all we can allow for, you know, we can't allow for the vast dimensions of what it means because we're actually too diverse and threatening and interesting. And that's why it's like, to me, I wanted to bring that element into the book too. And it's formation of like, I wanted the first two sections of the book to be really difficult and for people to just be like, like mind numbingly, like just like, Oh my God, like feeling like really just like, fuck. Um, like, cause I think that it's really important for you to know all of it. Like nobody teaches you this, you know, like we have to, if we, if we want to be in accordance, we need to know the history. So I wanted to have like a history lesson, you know, and then the first two, the, sorry, the last two sections are really about togetherness and care and community and, and also like understanding that once we do this work, we can do this work and this work is going to be more available and more present and more um, satisfying, you know, once we actually do the work and we keep thinking that we, we don't want to go through and do, do it. But I think that like, the more I look at the wound, the more I clear the wound, the more I'm sort of, I'm feeling lighter. The shadows are passing, you know, like they, it just, it's just a lot, but that's okay. Like I'm, I'm prepared. I feel like a warrior sometimes. Like I'm like, I came here to do this and I'm fucking prepared. And if I need to do what I need to do this, there's a lot of shadows, but there's a release. I don't know if it's joy, but it's release. It's definitely release. And it's definitely like lightness and a feeling of like ease my life. Like writing just flows out of me. Like I wrote that book in like nine months. You know, I did the research for like seven years, but I wrote it in nine months and it flew out, you know, and I have another book coming out in October and I'm trying to sell two other books. I think like I'm a channel for sure. And I feel like that's maybe that's the gift. You know, it's this is this is what you what happens when you transmutate that energy. I forget. It's been so wonderful to be in conversation with you. I like am such a huge fan and really, really grateful that we got this time with you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to our interview with Faria Roshin. This episode was part one of two in our series on Who is Wellness For?, We'll be back in a few weeks with a discussion episode featuring Nisha Gupta, Rachel Heath, and Tarfia Faizula. We'd love to hear what you think of Who is Wellness For? So write us at cbawloves at cbaw.org. CBAW Loves is a community building artworks podcast produced by Amelia Bain. CBAW is committed to mission belonging, reconnecting veterans with their communities. For more information, visit our website, www.cbaw.org.